Hi everyone! The previous videos introduced you to the hypothesis testing. The example with the cut and count analysis in the last video summarized the hypothesis testing machinery and paved the way to the today's topic. Today we are going to talk about hypothesis tests based on binned data. In particle physics, this is an extremely common and therefore important topic. By bin data, we mean that the result of our experiment is a histogram. Throughout the whole video, we are going to profit from what we've learned about template fits in the past. Let's try to summarize reasons why tests based on bin data are so popular in particle physics. The null and the alternative hypothesis predict some PDF for the individual events, but very often we don't know their analytical forms. Instead, we have sets of Monte Carlo events that were drawn from the PDFs. This by itself calls for the usage of binned data. Moreover, the theory predictions as well as detector simulation come with systematic uncertainties, and their impact on bin data can be estimated in a very elegant way. The systematic effects are propagated to uncertainties on event yields in the different bins. Also, there is a clear procedure how to incorporate uncertainties on event yields to the test. Let's start by a discussion of an unrealistic example without systematic uncertainties. Our model is very simple. The number of events in each bin of our histogram is distributed according to a Poisson distribution. For bin i, we have an i is distributed according to a Poisson distribution of n with mean equal to mu times s sub i plus b sub i. Here s sub i and b sub i are the expected numbers of signal and background events in the bin. They are estimated from the Monte Carlo. The parameter mu is free and it scales the production cross-section of the signal. It is called signal strength. Each value of mu stands for some hypothesis. The most important hypothesis is certainly mu equal to 1. This hypothesis can be described in words, for example, like this. The SpongeBob boson exists and its production cross-section is equal to the prediction of our favorite beyond standard model theory. Another prominent value is mu equal to 0 which stands for the hypothesis. I am sorry, but the SpongeBob boson doesn't exist. However, hypotheses that mu is different value are tested too. Very often, as you will see in the next video. It is trivial to write the likelihood function for the whole histogram. L of mu is equal to the product over i going from 1 to n bins, Poisson distribution of n sub i ops, with mean equal to mu times s sub i plus b sub i. As you can see, we are just profiting from what we've learned in the video on template fits. To test the hypothesis that the signal strength is some fixed number mu, we define lambda of mu is equal to L of mu over L of mu hat. Notice carefully the mu hat in the formula. It stands for the maximum likelihood estimate that is based on the observed data n sub i ops. Clearly, the term in the denominator is the global maximum of the likelihood function. Therefore, the value of the function lambda mu lies in the interval from 0 to 1. Finally, let's define the test statistic. 
d sub mu is equal to minus 2 times logarithm of lambda of mu. The fantastic usefulness of d sub mu as test statistic will become clear when considering systematic uncertainties in the test. For now, let's just remark that t sub mu can be viewed as a distance between data and the tested hypothesis. The higher t sub mu, the more discrepancy between data and the hypothesis that the signal strength is mu. The closer is the hypothesized fixed value mu to the maximum likelihood estimate mu hat, the closer is the value of lambda mu to 1, and therefore the closer is t sub mu to 0. Similarly, the higher is the difference between the hypothesized value mu and mu hat, the closer is the value of lambda mu to 0, and the larger is the value of t sub mu. Finally, we evaluate the p-value. p sub mu is equal to the integral from t sub mu ops to infinity f of t sub mu given mu d t sub mu. Note that we no longer write h0 or h1, but rather we simply quote the hypothesized value mu. Let me stress that the hypothesized value mu doesn't need to be the same value as in the subscript of the test statistic t sub mu. In the future videos, we will investigate distributions of the test statistic f of t sub mu given 0, f of t sub mu given 1, as well as f of t sub mu given mu. The question how to get a distribution of the test statistic is quite complex. There are two approaches, and let's discuss them right now. Before showing you an elegant way of getting the distribution, let's review another brute force method. The brute force method is pretty general. I am sure you guessed it. It is based on pseudo experiments. So we take our model and we profit from the knowledge of the expected numbers of signal and background events. We repeat the following procedure many times. We generate pseudo data n vector equal to n1, n2, blah, 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 n sub n bins by drawing each number from the corresponding Poisson distribution. We calculate the pseudo observed value t sub mu pseudo ops. We fill t sub mu pseudo ops to a histogram of t sub mu values. Finally, we normalize the resulting histogram and use it as an approximation of the test statistic distribution. Unfortunately, the number of repetitions might be really huge, like 10 to the power of 8 or so. That's why I called this method brute force. Now, the elegant way of estimating the distribution of our test statistic. Mr. Wilkes provides us with a very nice theorem, giving a wonderful formula. As every elegant thing, it has a caveat, though. Wilkes' formula is asymptotic. It is valid just for large data samples. Once we have a large sample, things can't be simpler. The distribution is, yes, it is the chi-square distribution. Who doesn't know it yet? Whenever there is a need for a distribution, big chance is that it will be the chi-square distribution. So let's write the magic formula down. f of t sub mu given mu is equal to the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom of t sub mu. And let's be very explicit. Chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom of t sub mu is equal to 1 over 
2 to the power of 1 half, gamma of 1 half, t sub mu to the power of 1 half, all this times e to the minus t sub mu times 1 half. For now, let's not get stressed about distributions of t sub mu given other hypothesized values of the signal strength. We can postpone this question to later. Let's just enjoy the fantastic simplicity of the Wilkes asymptotic formula. The only uncomfortable question is, what the hell does the large sample mean? Simply. Large sample means that n sub i is large for each i. And how large? Glenn Coven and his colleagues did many tests with Monte Carlo, and they realized that Wilkes' theorem can be valid for n i as low as n sub i greater or approximately equal to 5. Calculation of the p-value is just a matter of looking into some table or invoking a method from some statistical programming library. p sub mu is equal to 1 minus the cumulative distribution of chi-square with one degree of freedom of t sub mu ops. If you have more parameters of interest than just one, let's say we have m of them, then everything runs in the same way. You find their maximum likelihood estimates, etc. And the distribution of the test statistics becomes chi-square with m degrees of freedom. We can write f of t sub mu vector given mu vector is equal to the chi-square distribution with m degrees of freedom of t sub mu vector. The final topic of this video is how to incorporate systematic uncertainties into our test. It sounds it will be super complicated, but no, we've prepared a very solid basis and we are going to profit from it. First of all, recall the likelihood function we derived in the video on template fits. L of mu vector, gamma vector and alpha vector is equal to the product over i going from 1 to n bins Poisson distribution of n sub i ops with mean equal to sum over p mu p times mu p i plus sum over k delta p i k of alpha k all this times gamma i a second term in the product is a Poisson distribution of mi with mean equal to mi times gamma i and all this times product over k, normal distribution of alpha k with mean equal to 0 and sigma equal to 1. Basically, it is a constraint extended likelihood function for bint data. The most common constraint terms are, as used here, the Gaussian and the Poisson distributions. However, other constraint terms are possible as well. The parameters gamma vector correspond to statistical uncertainties in the individual bins of our histogram due to the limited number of Monte Carlo events. The parameters alpha vector correspond to our systematic uncertainties, like uncertainty on the electron energy calibration, resolution, uncertainties on selection criteria efficiencies and inefficiencies, theory uncertainties, and others. 
the function delta p i k of alpha k stands for the change in the event yield of a process p in a bin i given a shift of an underlying parameter k by alpha k times sigma k. Sigma k is the standard deviation of the underlying parameter estimator. The parameters gamma vector and alpha vector are often called nuisance parameters because we aren't interested in their values. In the present chapter, we don't need to distinguish between the different sources of systematic uncertainty and therefore we will use a common symbol theta vector. Therefore, we will denote the likelihood function L of mu vector and theta vector. You might become surprised when you see how similar the test machineries with and without systematics are. First, let's define the profile likelihood ratio. We will call it lambda of mu vector as we called the analogous quantity in the test without systematics. Here we go. Lambda of mu vector is equal to L of mu vector and theta vector hat hat of mu vector over L of mu vector hat and theta vector hat. Here, mu vector hat and theta vector hat are the maximum likelihood estimates. The symbol with two hats, theta vector hat hat of mu vector, stands for values of the nuisance parameters that maximize the likelihood function for given fixed values of the parameters of interest mu vector. If we have just one parameter of interest and one nuisance parameter, we can illustrate how the function theta hat of mu looks like in the mu theta plane. In this case, the likelihood is a function of two parameters. For each fixed value of mu, we find a value of theta that maximizes the function. Now let's define the test statistic for the test with systematic uncertainties. T sub mu vector is equal to minus 2 times logarithm of lambda mu vector. Again, this test statistic can be viewed as a sort of a distance between the hypothesis and the observed data. If the value of t sub mu vector is high, then there is a high incompatibility of data with the hypothesis mu vector. The p-value is given by the following expression. p sub mu vector is equal to the integral from t sub mu vector ops to infinity f of t sub mu vector given mu vector and theta vector dt sub mu vector and this is equal to p sub mu vector of theta vector. The dependence of the p-value on the nuisance parameters is definitely a nuisance. The problem is that our tested hypothesis, defined by values mu vector, is not fully specified by fixing the parameters mu vector. Our model has many more parameters because the nuisance parameters are there. Therefore, we don't really know which hypothesis to test. There is one hypothesis for each set of mu vector and theta vector values. If we were fragmentist purists, then we would need to test all hypotheses given by different sets of values for theta vector. We would only reject the hypothesis mu vector if p sub mu vector of theta vector is lower than alpha for each theta vector. This would be the same thing as replacing p sub mu vector by maximum over theta vector of p sub mu vector theta vector. 
For the case of just two parameters, mu and theta, an example dependence of the p-value on the nuisance parameter could look like this curve. In this case, we wouldn't be able to reject the hypothesis just because of some very unlikely values of this parameter. Fortunately, Mr. Wilkes is coming to save us. He is having one more theorem for us. Again, the theorem is valid for large data samples, and again, large can mean that in each bin of our histogram the number of events is about 5 or greater. Here we go with Wilkes asymptotic formula number 2. T sub mu vector is equal to minus 2 logarithm of L of mu vector and theta vector head head of mu vector over L of mu vector head and theta vector head. And this is distributed according to a chi-square distribution with m degrees of freedom. Do you understand what it means? The distribution of the test statistic is independent of the nuisance parameters in the large sample limit. Isn't this magic? With the profile likelihood ratio, we got the same asymptotic formula for the test statistic distribution as if there were no systematic uncertainties. Recall that the number m is equal to the number of parameters of interest. In situation when our data sample is not large enough, we can use an approximate p-value. p sub mu vector is equal to the integral from t sub mu vector ops to infinity f of t sub mu vector given mu vector and theta vector head head of mu vector dt sub mu vector. This is called the profile construction and it is also widely used in particle physics. In this case, the distribution would need to be estimated with the use of pseudo-experiments. The whole point of the profile construction is that we generate pseudo-data from a model in which we fixed the nuisance parameters to values that maximize the likelihood function for given fixed values of the hypothesized parameters mu vector.